Hello everybody. Welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at unit 4.5, which is all about stoichiometry. Um, I imagine much of it will be review from Chem 1, okay? But it's a lot of math, so you're going to need your calculators. And also, I'm going to be working a lot of problems, and some of them I'll ask you to pause the video, others I'm going to actually like walk you through step by step. But remember that, you know, even if you want to try a problem on your own without me walking you through it, you can always, of course, pause the video and try it on your own. So let's get started. All right, so stoichiometry is all about the study of quantities that are consumed, our reactants, and produced our products and using a known amount of something in a chemical reaction to determine some unknown amount. And those of you that are in my class, you've seen this, um, something similar to this graphic organizer before when we talked about back in unit one about how to convert between moles and particles and liters and grams and all that. So it's the same graphical organizer. It's just been expanded a little bit. So in any stoichiometry problem, you're always going to have some given, and that's what's represented on the left, and there will always be some unknown. Okay, so just to review with you real quickly, if we're going back and forth between moles and number of particles, atoms, molecules, ions, formula units, we would use Avogadro's number as the conversion factor. If we're going back and forth between moles and grams of a substance, you're going to use the molar mass off the periodic table as your conversion factor. And if we're in this area where you're converting between liters and moles or moles to liters, the direction doesn't matter, you are going to use that number 22.4 liters for every one mole. But remember that that number is for gases only, and not just gases only, but gases at what we call STP, standard temperature and pressure. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail today at the end of this lesson. Okay, on the right hand side of this figure here, you see the same thing and the same conversion factors for the unknown are going to be used. To refresh your memory back from Chem 1, once you've converted into moles of your given, whether that's a reactant or a product, doesn't matter, you need to convert to moles of unknown first. And the way you get from moles of your given to moles of your unknown is through what is called the molar ratio, which really just means using the coefficients from your balanced equation. And that's why it says in red, you cannot do stoichiometry, guys, without using a balanced chemical equation. It must be balanced. Otherwise, you're going to get the wrong answer. Okay, so the coefficients are how you get from one side of this diagram to the other, from given to your unknown. So let's just start off with a real simple example. Okay, and I'm going to work through this one with you just to sort of jog your memory back from Chem 1. It says, how many grams of iron three oxide are needed to produce 15 grams of iron from the following reaction? And this, in some cases, the reaction will be written out for you. Sometimes you'll have to write out the reaction yourself. When you're given a reaction, or if you have to come up with it, doesn't matter, you again must ensure that it's balanced and this guy does not look balanced. So let's fix that. Okay, here's my given. 
15 grams of iron and grams of iron oxide is my unknown. So I'm starting with an amount of product and I'm converting to reactant and you can do that. Stoichiometry, you can convert from product to reactant, reactant to product, reactant to reactant. It doesn't matter between any two parts of a chemical reaction. So we always start with our given, okay? And think about that diagram, okay? I need to first change into moles of my given. For every one mole of iron, there are 55.8 grams of iron and then Again, think to that, that graphic organizer there. I need to convert from moles of my given to moles of my unknown. And what do we use for that conversion factor? We use the coefficients. Okay, and then the last step, the problem asks us to convert our final answer into grams, which I'm going to pull off the periodic table. Let me just tally up that number, that total molar mass, 159.6. And then look at the units that cancel out. And I'm left with the unit that they asked for, so let's do the math here. And I'm gonna to round to two significant figures. All right, so that problem was a bit of a warm up for you. I want you to try this next one, which really isn't any more difficult, there's just Two things that are a little bit different. Number one, you are gonna have to write out the balanced equation yourself, but it gives you enough information to do so. The other thing is that the given has molarity tied up in it. Don't panic, just go back to basics. What is the formula for molarity? How do you use the information given to get into moles of your given so that you can then start the stoichiometry process. So pause your video, see how you do. All right, let's see if you got it right. So I've got my balanced equation up at the top and the information for the hydrochloric acid, I was given a molarity and guys, please notice that I had to change the volume that was given into liters because that's what's tied up in that molarity equation. I used that to find moles of hydrochloric acid and then I started the stoichiometry process and was able to solve for grams of hydrogen. Okay, so you did problems like this back in Chem 1. You might not have had them um, where molarities were involved, but it's really not that complicated. All right, something else that's reviewed from Chem 1 is the concept of limiting reactant. All right, and let's define it. A limiting reactant is the reactant that is consumed, used up first, and that will limit the amount of product that gets made. Okay, now how do you know when you're given a, a problem on the, on the test or the AP exam, how do you know you're dealing with a limiting reactant situation? Because your given is not just one piece of information. You are given amounts of both, or maybe there's even three reactants. You're given amounts of all of your reactants. And maybe you're supposed to come up with, determine how much product is made. How do you know which reactant to use as you're given? Well, actually, you're going to use both, right? 
So these are kind of the steps that I use to solve a limiting reactant problem. There are other ways, and if you're one of my students, I can show you that other way. Um, but this is the one method that I find the most useful. As I said, you'd be given amounts of, let's say there's two reactants, I'd be given amounts of both of them. If I am supposed to determine how much product is made, I'm going to use both of those givens, and I'm going to do two separate stoichiometry problems, okay, and I'm going to have two possible answers for how much product has been made. How do I know which one is the correct answer? The one that is smaller is the correct one, okay? That is the correct amount of product. Whichever answer is smaller came from the limiting reactant or limiting reagent. Those it, Reagent just means reactant, same thing. The reactant that gave me the larger amount of product must, therefore, be the excess reagent, okay? And as I said, there is another method, and I'm happy to show that to you at another time, um, but this is the method that I find to be the most useful. So the lesser amount of product is the true answer for how much product will be made. So let's look at an example. All right, we've got a balanced equation, right? I can see that it is not balanced, so we would need to do that. And the question says, what mass of ammonia can be produced from a mixture of 100 grams of nitrogen and 500 grams of hydrogen? So what I'm going to ask you to do is to follow you know, what I just described. Take each one of those amounts of reactant do two separate stoichiometry problems and have two separate possible answers for grams of ammonia and then stop there. Okay, so pause the video and get to that point. All right, so remember that you needed to balance that equation. All right, but once you did that, as I said, I asked you to take each one of those given amounts convert both of them to grams of ammonia, and I have two possible answers in front of me. The question said how much ammonia will be produced. The answer is the smaller amount of product. Okay, now work backwards. If that's the correct amount of product that will be made, that must mean, if I come back here, that must mean that nitrogen is my limiting reactant, okay? And sometimes the AP exam will ask questions that'll simply say, you know, give you these starting amounts and say, show calculations to indicate which reactant is limiting. These are the kinds of calculations they want to see. If you only showed one of these, they would not accept it, okay? You would not get the points. You have to show both. And then usually, guys, I recommend making a statement like, because nitrogen gave the smaller amount of product through stoichiometry, nitrogen must be the limiting reactant, hydrogen must be the excess. Okay, now, it's not quite the end of the problem, and this is something you might have done in Chem 1, you might not. The last part of this says, how much unreacted material remains? Okay, unreacted material, let me, let me translate that for you. How much excess reactant will be left over? Okay, so let's come back over to our calculation here. There's more than one way to do this. We know that we started this problem or started this reaction with 500 grams of hydrogen. But because I know that that's going to be my excess, that means there's going to be some hydrogen left over. In order to find that out, 
I need to know how much hydrogen was consumed. And you can figure that out one of two ways. You could either take your amount of product that we know has been created and take that number and work stoichiometry to solve for how many grams of hydrogen did that use up. You could also, if you prefer, start with the limiting reactant. I know that all 100 grams of nitrogen was consumed. Let's do math to figure out how much hydrogen was consumed. It doesn't matter which method you choose, you're gonna get the same answer. I'm gonna start with the amount of limiting reactant, which I know has been completely consumed. And I'm going to convert grams of N2 into grams of H2. And let's just see where that gets us. And we're going to try to get to H2. Molar mass off the periodic table of hydrogen is 2.0 grams. So when we do this math, let me type this in. Okay, I get a number like this. And I'm not rounding anything yet because this is not my final answer, okay? Now, let me make sure that you all understand what that number is that I just solved for. That is the amount of hydrogen that was consumed, okay? I know how much I started with, 500 grams. If I subtract, how much was consumed, that should leave me with how much was remaining in excess. And I'm gonna to round to no decimal places. We'll call that 479. Okay, so that is the amount of hydrogen that is left over at the end that did not react. So very often in a stoichiometry situation on the AP exam, you're going to be asked how much excess material is left over, okay? And that is how you do it, all right? So here's another practice problem that is, is, a, is a simpler one, and it's, and it's a visual one as well, okay? So I'll introduce it to you. It says the diagram at the left represents, same reaction actually, hydrogen and nitrogen in a closed container, which of the following diagrams would represent the results if the reaction shown below were to proceed as far as possible? Just to translate that, as far as possible, ladies and gentlemen, means until, you know, the reaction proceeds until one of the reactants is completely consumed. Okay. Just to get you started on it, and then I want you to pause your video, I want you to look at the diagram on the left, okay, right here, where we are given the amounts of our reactants. And ladies and gentlemen, when you are given a drawing like this, count the number of molecules. For example, I can see in this drawing that there are three hydrogen molecules you may translate that into moles. Think of it as having three moles of hydrogen. I can see that I also have three moles of nitrogen. Those are your starting amounts, okay? You guys pause your video and take it from here. All right, let's see how you did. So I'm showing you the different calculations that I did, okay? I took the amounts of each reactant, converted it to product, 
and I can see that the hydrogen gives me the smaller amount of product, so I know that that is the correct amount of product. So let's look up at our answer choices, and I can start to eliminate some of them. For example, I can eliminate B and C because these molecules here are drawn backwards. <laughs> that has hydrogen in the center and the nitrogens around it, and that's, that's not what ammonia looks like. Okay, now A, D, and E all have two moles, two molecules of ammonia in them. Okay, so they're all correct in that situation, in that standpoint. But let's look at what else is there. All right, remember what we said. If two moles of ammonia is the correct amount of product, that must mean that hydrogen is the limiting reactant, which means it's the one that's completely consumed. Hydrogen looks like that, the two, two black atoms there. So I can eliminate answer choice D because answer choice D shows some hydrogen still floating around and that shouldn't be there. So now it's down between A and E and you can simply count the circles if you want. I can see that there should be some nitrogen left over. Letter A is showing that nitrogen has been completely consumed and that's not, that's not the case. Okay, so E is the correct answer. So sometimes you can have a limiting reactant problem with a more complex calculation, or it could be something more simple like this in multiple choice. Another way um, that stoichiometry is brought into word problems is with the concept of yield. Again, this should be a review topic from Chem 1. If you all will recall the concept of theoretical yield, okay? If ever you see that term, theoretical yield means the amount of product you would get if you ran a reaction and everything was perfect. There was 0% error, okay? It's the amount of product you should get if everything is perfect. Now, is that realistic? No, it's not. Of course, we live in the real world where there is error. So when you run the experiment, the amount of product that you actually obtain is called, oh so cleverly, the actual yield. And then when you put these two concepts together into an equation, it's calculating something called percent yield, which is always actual over theoretical. A comes before T in the alphabet. And if you think about it, guys, the percent number itself, your percent yield, is actually kind of like putting a number on how good was your lab technique. You know, if you run a reaction and you get maybe 65% yield, that's not so great. Maybe you want to redo that. And for those of you that go on to take um, higher levels of chem in college, sometimes the chem lab courses in college, when they have you calculate a percent yield, they will make you redo it if it's below a certain percentage because they want to see a better accuracy there. Okay, sometimes, not always. So let's look at a problem. I'll introduce it to you and then I want you to pause the video and try it, all right? Before I read this though, let me just say something to you, ladies and gentlemen. AP exam and test questions are never, 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 ever, never, ever gonna give you the theoretical yield. You will always have to calculate that using stoichiometry. Okay, so let's look at this problem. It says, aluminum burns in bromine producing aluminum bromide. There's all the information you need to write a balanced equation. In a laboratory, six grams of aluminum reacts with excess bromine. Okay, now don't let that word excess freak you out and think, oh man, this is another limiting reactant problem. Nope. 
since they're telling you that the bromine is the excess reactant, that must mean the aluminum is the limiting, and we always want to use the limiting to get an accurate amount of product. The last sentence says 50.3 grams of aluminum bromide are produced. Now remember what I said, guys. You will never, never, ever be given the theoretical yield. So what is that amount? 50.3 grams of aluminum bromide? What must that be? It's the actual yield. So this question says, calculate the theoretical and percent yield. I want you guys to do that. Pause the video. Try it. Okay, let's check your answer. So you can see the first thing I did was I wrote out a balanced equation. Then I used that six grams of aluminum. That was my given information. I used stoichiometry to calculate the theoretical yield of aluminum bromide. You'll always have to calculate that. So that other amount of grams of aluminum bromide must have been the actual yield, which I then plugged into my percent yield equation, and I get 84.8% for my yield. Okay, so that brings yield into the picture when we're talking about stoichiometry. The last part of this lesson has to do with stoichiometry still, but what happens when gases are involved? What are some situations you could see there? And of course, guys, reactions always happen in moles. Remember, when we're doing stoichiometry, you always have to get your given into moles, convert it to moles of your unknown before you can do anything else. If you're dealing with a gas in your reaction, okay, you need to ask yourself this question. Is this reaction taking place at STP, standard temperature and pressure, yes or no? Remember guys that the conditions of STP, that's zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure, you don't have to memorize those values. It's actually written on your equation sheet. If the answer is yes, this reaction is taking place at STP, you are permitted to use that conversion factor that one mole of a gas will occupy 22.4 liters. And you can just do straight stoichiometry and use that number. But what if you're not at STP? If that is the case, then you have to use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, to calculate moles of that gas or the volume of that gas, depending on the situation. Okay, and we're gonna look at examples of both. So we have a reaction in front of us Okay, this one is actually already balanced. And the first question says, calculate the mass of sodium bicarbonate, that's the first reactant there, necessary to produce 2.87 liters of carbon dioxide at STP. Now remember what we said, if it's at STP, you can just use that conversion factor 22.4 and be done. It's just straight stoichiometry. Okay, but we're going to see something different for number two. So let's, let's just knock out number one real quick. I want you to pause your video and get the answer for number one, and then we're going to talk through number two. Okay, so number one should have been a pretty quick one because we are at STP. You can use 22.4 as a conversion factor and that's all you have to do is just straight stoichiometry. And so I get 10.8 grams of sodium bicarbonate. Okay, simple. Number two is a little bit more complicated. So let's look at it together. 
All right, it says if 27 liters of gas are produced, well, the only gas that's on the product side is carbon dioxide. Okay, 26 degrees Celsius, 745 Tor. Okay, stop there. That's not at STP. All right, so I know I'm going to have to use PV equals NRT at some point point at this problem. So what I do, guys, is I write it out, even still as a professional, I still do this. I know I'm going to use that equation. And so I write it out and I look at what do I, what pieces do I have? What pieces am I missing? Okay. So again, okay, we've got this gas, we've got a temperature, we have a pressure, and it says this is produced when 2.6 liters of hydrochloric HCl are added, okay, and I'm going to write that in, in my equation, but I'm going to circle this, that is not a gas, okay, I cannot plug in values for something that is aqueous, into the ideal gas law, okay? All right, so it says I've got, I've reacted 2.6 liters of hydrochloric acid. What is the concentration of HCl? Concentration is just a fancy word for molarity, ladies and gentlemen, and think about it. If I know the volume of this hydrochloric acid, and I'm supposed to be finding the concentration, the molarity. What's that other piece that I need? I need moles of that HCl. If I can find moles of that aqueous hydrochloric acid, I can solve this problem. Let's come back to the ideal gas law, which I know that I'm gonna have to use. And let's ask ourselves, what do we know about the gas in this problem? And I'm come up to that equation, PV equals NRT. Do I have a pressure given in this problem? Yes, I do. Do I have a volume of the gas? Yes, I do. Okay, do I know the number of moles? No, I don't, so I'm gonna circle it. Remember, R is that gas constant, which is on your equation sheet. You always have access to that. And we're also given a temperature. So in this particular problem, I can use the ideal gas law right away to solve for moles of CO2. So let me get to a fresh screen. And I'm just going to continue that problem that we were on that same screen here. So this is now number two. And I'm going to use that ideal gas law right away. And it was, the pressure was 745 Tor. All right, what was the volume? 27 liters. I don't know the number of moles. The gas constant when you're working with TOR is 62.36. And the temperature was 26 degrees Celsius, so that's 299 Kelvin. Remember, your temperatures have always got to be in Kelvin. So if we do the math here, and we're going to get our number of moles, and I'm not going to round too much here because this is not my final answer. But always write out moles of what? Okay, this is moles of carbon dioxide, which is not what we were trying to get to. We were trying to get to moles of HCl, but I can do that easily now using stoichiometry. They were in a one-to-one -one ratio. So I end up with the same number of moles of HCl. OK, 
Okay, and the last part of this problem, what they were ultimately asking us for was the concentration, the molarity of that aqueous hydrochloric acid solution, and I can now do that. And what was that volume? 2.6. Let's round to two significant figures. If you're off, if you get a different number by, than I do by like one decimal place, no big deal. But there's my final answer. Okay, so let me say again, when you are not at STP, you know you're gonna have to use the ideal gas law, all right? So what I do is I write it out and I put check marks over what I have and what I don't for, for the gas that's in this problem. In this particular problem, I could use PV equals NRT right away. But ladies and gentlemen, you're going to come across situations where you have this. You have this, this, and this, but you're missing both moles of your gas and volume of your gas, which means in a situation like that, you can't use PV equals NRT right away. You would have to do your stoichiometry first. Of course, you'd have to be given enough information to do that. Find moles of your gas and then plug it into the formula to solve for volume. So Every problem is a little bit different, which is why I always caution against memorizing. You've got to understand what's going on. Okay, so in this problem, we use the ideal gas law first, and then we did stoichiometry, but they're not always like that. Sometimes you have to do the stoichiometry first, and then you can use the ideal gas law. Every problem is a little bit different. Okay, along those same lines, we're still talking about gases. On occasion, you will see situations where the gas that is on the product side is collected in an unusual way, all right? If you ever come across a word problem where it says, the gas, and here's, I'm going to even underline it for you. The gas has been collected over water. Okay, this is a unique situation. And I, this picture, what I'm trying to show you is, and it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but the gas that's being produced from this reaction here is being run through a tube and bubbled up through an upturned beaker. And that's a really clever way to collect a gas. You know, I suppose you could put a balloon over the top of that um, test tube if you wanted to, but this is just another way to collect that gas, that product gas. Here's the problem though, okay? In this space, okay, when the reaction is over, all right, this particular reaction is showing oxygen was being produced. So in that space right there, I have collected the oxygen gas. Yes, of course. But because it was collected over water, ladies and gentlemen, there's also, so there's oxygen gas, but there's also water vapor up in that space. I mean, if you have a water bottle with a cap on the top, the space above that water, it's not just air, it's also some water vapor, okay? Because even at room temperature, water will evaporate a little bit. So I'm gonna make up a totally ridiculous number. Let's say the pressure in that space up at the top of that beaker, again, this is a completely ridiculous number, is like 14 atmospheres, okay? well. I care about the pressure of the gas that I'm supposed to be focusing on. How am I supposed to know what the pressure of just the oxygen is? Well, we would 
have to give you the vapor pressure of the water, and I'm just making up a completely ridiculous number. Let's say it was two atmospheres. Think about partial pressures, ladies and gentlemen. If the total pressure up in that space is 14 atmospheres, and the water itself is contributing two of those atmospheres, guess what? All you gotta do is subtract the pressure of just the oxygen would then be 12. Okay, so the only, like this would come up in a gas law stoichiometry question. The only thing you'd have to do differently is if the question says the gas has been collected over water, you just need to subtract the pressure of the water, which ladies and gentlemen would be given to you. Because remember, you wanna focus on the pressure of just the gas that's in the reaction. So you'd have to just do a little extra step of subtraction. All right, so let's look at this problem. This is actually the exact reaction they were showing in that picture, the decomposition of potassium chlorate. And if you'll notice, oxygen gas is produced. What volume of O2, ooh, there's that phrase, collected over water at a total pressure of 94 torr and 22 degrees can be produced from 26 grams of potassium chlorate? And then we're given a little extra information here. The vapor pressure of water at 22 degrees is 21 torr. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a hint here, all right? This situation is not at STP. I know that I'm going to have to use the ideal gas law at some point, so I would write it out. Ask yourself, do I have all of the pieces for oxygen gas? Because that's the only gas. You can't use the ideal gas law for a solid and try it from there. So pause the video, see if you can solve this one. All right, let's talk through this problem. The first thing that I notice, guys, is that this gas, this oxygen gas, has been collected over water. They've given us the total pressure, they've given us the pre vapor pressure of water, so the first thing I'm gonna do is that subtraction to get the pressure of just the oxygen gas. Okay, so let's look at what I've done. So look at the very top, that's the first thing I did. Then I said, all right, I see that I'm not at STP, I wrote out the ideal gas law and I put check marks over what pieces of information do I have for oxygen. I had a pressure, we always know that constant, the R constant, and I had a temperature you can see that I had two unknowns. I didn't know the moles of O2 and I didn't know the volume. So I can't use that equation right away because I have two unknowns. However, if you noticed in the problem, you were given the grams of the reactant, which means I could use stoichiometry to solve for the moles of O2. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I could take that and plug it in right there. And then I only have one unknown in the ideal gas law, the volume, and I was able to solve for the volume of oxygen. So this is the flip-flop of that other gas law problem we saw. Sometimes you can use the ideal gas law right away. Sometimes you can't and you have to do stoichiometry first and then use the ideal gas law. Just remember guys, keep saying to yourself, it's an ideal gas law. The biggest mistake students make with problems like this is they try to plug in values for a solid or something aqueous into that gas law and you can't do that. That's illegal. So, 
that was a lot of information. And some of it is review from Chem 1, but some of it may have been new to you. So I appreciate your patience in sticking with this lesson, this video. I hope you learned a little something and I look forward to seeing you all next time.